Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, and uh, delighted that Professor Helen Sullivan, Dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific, will be opening today's uh, ANU, ANU uh, Energy Update 2022. Helen. Ah, thank you, Frank, and uh, apologies for being a couple of minutes late. I've been opening things all day, and uh, it's uh, one of the great joys of being Dean is that you get to see snippets of all the extraordinary things that we do uh, here in the college and indeed the university, but then you have to run off and go and see something else. So, um, uh, as Frank says, I'm Helen Sullivan. I'm the Dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here to the ANU Energy Update for 2022, which will consider whether the current energy crisis, which is bothering us all, will accelerate transitions to a renewable energy and more. Um, uh, Frank, uh, uh, just outside, said, um, do you have notes? And I said, yes, I don't have much to say. And he said, oh, that's not like you. So let's see. Anyway, uh, but before we get into that, um, I want to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands and indeed airwaves we meet, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and pay my respects to elders past and present, and also extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in, in, in attendance, both in person and online today, and indeed all other First Nations people who may be joining us. The ANU Energy Update has long been a must attend for those in the energy community. This year's programme, convened by Professor Frank Yotzo and the team at the ANU Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions, together with several research groups at the ANU, will deliver another essential update on the recent developments in energy research and analysis. These types of occasions are also an important opportunity for the broader community of experts in research and policy, business and civil society to come together to meet and discuss. The name of the precinct here is Cambry, which means meeting place. And the ANU is indeed a meeting place for many different people and perspectives. And we are very grateful to the traditional custodians for, for gifting us uh, that word Cambry, uh, which um, demarcates this building and this place. I'm glad to see that today's meeting place has extended virtually, and I'm told that participants from the Institute's various executive education and capacity building programs in the region will be joining us today, which is fantastic. One of the, one of the uh, positive spin-offs, I guess, of, of COVID is that we are now more able to, to connect with people in these hybrid forms, in particular those from Vietnam, Laos, Philippines, and Indonesia. Welcome to all of you, and I hope that you find the programme, especially the final session of Momentum Towards Clean Energy in Asia, offers many opportunities to consider the challenges of energy transition. As we celebrate the bringing together of many different people and perspectives in this meeting place, I see from the programme that there is a 50-50 gender mix amongst the speakers. This is amazing to see in this particular forum that Frank has consistently told me over the years as I've badgered him about this, uh, that is a... Um, a very, very gender skewed um, environment. So it is absolutely wonderful to see that uh, we've got to 50-50 here. I want to thank all of the speakers for making time to join us today, especially those who are joining us in person and online from other organizations and who will be in conversation with ANU researchers, namely Anthea Harris, the CEO of the Energy Security Board, who's here with us, Tennant Reed from the Australia Industry Group, Claire Maris from Victoria State Government, and Dr. Mika Obashai, Ob, Obashai, I do apologize, I've been running around too much, Director of Japan's Renewable Energy Institute. 2022 has been a tumultuous year for energy following Russia's war in Ukraine and the resulting impacts on supply. It is clear now more than ever, we need to increase the transition to renewable energy. I hope that today's programme not only offers you insights on decarbonisation trajectories, both in Australia and across the region, but also some solutions to the energy crisis and getting to net zero emissions. I will now pass over to Dr. Rebecca Pierce from the ANU School of Sociology and the Fenner School of Environment and Society to chair the first session on energy developments and decarbonisation trajectories. Thank you so much.
Thanks so much, Helen, and, and welcome everyone. I want to um, acknowledge that we're meeting here on the unceded lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples and um, pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So here we are at the first session um, of an exciting event where we're going to uh, explore uh, energy developments uh, and decarbonisation trajectories with three really um, creative uh, and insightful experts from across academia, industry and government. Um, so this annual event brings together people from academia, policy, industry and the public service. We're going to be focusing on the decarbonisation of, of industry and electricity, decentralised energy and the energy transition in our broader region over the course of today. Um, but we're going to get more focused on our neighbourhood here in Australia first off. Our fabulous expert panel that's is just about to join um, uh, begins with Professor Frank Yotso, Head of Energy and the ANU Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions, Anthea Harris, Chief, Ex Chief Executive Officer of the Energy Security Board, and Tennant Reid, um, who'll join us via Zoom. Um, who's national, Principal National Advisor for the Australian Industry Group. They're going to give us a briefing on trends globally, as well as Australia, emerging outcomes um, in the federal government safeguard mechanism for reducing emissions in industry, um, electricity grid developments, and no doubt much more. The beginning question when you registered for this event was, um, does the energy crisis accelerate uh, transitions to renewable energy and there will be many other questions I hope we can come around to um, in the in the discussion that proceed uh, that comes after our presentations but first we need to get updated I'm going to invite the speakers to join us on the on the stage now for their six minute bursts uh, while they're doing that a quick um, uh, sort of note on the Q&A session that will come um, Oh, sorry, do you want to sit? Sorry, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, a quick note on the uh, audience Q&A afterwards. At the end, we'll take questions. You'll be able to post on VVOX, the digital engagement platform, um, and I'll moderate those questions when we finally do join the stage. Um, so thank you for that slight hiccup in my understanding of the order of things. Um, let's move straight on and hear from Frank Yotso first. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks. Well, um, we'll join on the uh, on the stage in a minute. Our third speaker is actually uh, online. So I'd like to add my acknowledgement of First Nation uh, peoples, uh, because now, many of the large scale investments that we will see in the energy space on this continent will actually interact with Indigenous rights and practices and absolutely imperative uh, that we uh, get that uh, get that right. Now, um, so an update on energy sector developments in 10 minutes, okay? Um, I'll, I'll attempt to draw out a few things. Um, uh, I would happily stand here and, uh, and give a full-sized lecture of 90 minutes or so, but um, that's not what we want to do. We want to use this occasion to actually uh, have a conversation and that'll be the theme throughout the afternoon. We've got long breaks in between the sessions and we'll have ample opportunity within the sessions uh, for conversation among the panels um, and uh, with everyone in the room as well as online. So um, much of the work at the ANU these days, and in fact at all of our universities um, on energy, um, comes in, uh, in, in some direction at the question of the transition to low and zero carbon emissions energy systems and industrial systems and so forth. So the overriding question is always how we're doing, right? Um, and so roughly speaking, global energy sector emissions are sort of Flatlining, maybe not really. We're we've got an estimate of about a one percent growth in fossil fuel combustion emissions in 2022. Uh, latest estimates from the Global Carbon Project. So, in part, that's still COVID rebound, right? Uh, in other parts, it reflects uh, sort of a. Uh, a scrambling uh, for, uh, you know, backfilling for Russian gas supplies in Western Europe, um, 
Uh, and so uh, there's every chance that we will see that growth moderating uh, in 2023, not, not uh, you know, staring crystal ball too deeply there. Where do things need to go? Well, we want to stay under two degrees. We need to uh, reduce global emissions uh, swiftly and deeply from about the middle uh, of this decade. So we're not totally out of whack with the under, under two degree uh, traje trajectory globally. But we're out of whack with 1.5 degrees. Okay. Um, now, what needs to happen for any such uh, decarbonization scenario that's in some ways climate change compatible? Um, well, a tremendous shift away from fossil fuels and towards zero carbon energy sources, principally uh, renewable. So these charts are taken from the uh, IEA, IEA World Energy Outlook, came out just recently. Red line is fossil fuel supply going down. Green line uh, is non-fossil fuel supply going up, right? It's pretty consistent across the scenarios. And so the left-hand scenario, the APS, right? That's not, that's not a sort of like a, a dreamt up scenario. This is actually current announced pledges that, uh, that countries have made, right? And extrapolating uh, from them. What needs to happen for that? A tremendous upscaling of global energy system investment. Okay, and the estimates here are that total energy sector investment might need to be increased um, from around $2 trillion a year currently uh, to between 4 to $5 trillion annually uh, by 2030 in a net zero emission scenario. So this is a sizable share um, of global GDP, right, that, that you've got going in there. And so big questions behind that, right? Of course, that money is going to be used to build up an energy system that is environmentally uh, much more friendly than, than today's energy system. That's more resilient against energy price shocks. Um, and that is kind of a gift to future generations in that way, but it will divert resources from other walks of life to uh, energy. Uh, tremendous uh, investment there needed also in end use, uh, electrification, energy efficiency. Now, geopolitics, right? Uh, Russia's war on Ukraine. Uh, and so for a while, the dominant view was that this really throws back the decarbonization agenda because of diminished emphasis on climate policy, can't afford anything anymore, et cetera, et cetera. It's now, I would posit, um, becoming clearer that in fact, what we're likely to see is the opposite, namely an acceleration of decarbonization and acceleration in investment uh, in clean energy. And the driving reason is not an environmental one, it's energy security. So for any energy importer, um, you know, there's an acutely raised awareness of the vulnerabilities of being an energy importer, right? Because of physical supply security, as well as the massively elevated prices that we're seeing. And that tremendously increases the incentive to actually invest locally. And investing locally in energy importing countries almost always means renewable energy, right? Uh, German finance in, uh, minister is on record as calling renewable energy freedom energy. And uh, that gives you a measure of where uh, things are at. High energy prices also. What do high energy prices do? Well, they provoke investment in energy efficiency uh, and in energy supply capabilities. So the solution to high energy prices is high energy prices. Strategic competition, right? Um, we're seeing a lot more of that. And increasingly, we're seeing industry policy in the major powers and in those countries that see a potential competitive advantage for themselves in the supply of zero carbon equipment, um, uh, subsidizing clean energy industries, right? US Inflation Reduction Act, big time, various European countries have very large programs, China active in that space as well. And of course, the rest of the world will be saying, thank you very much for even cheaper clean energy technologies. How are we going in Australia? Um, we're just about halfway there in terms of the 43% emission reduction target by 2030, uh, 140 million tons already reduced, but most of those reductions from 2005 are from land use change and forestry, not the energy sector. We've pretty much run out of opportunity, large scale opportunities in the land use and forestry sector. The rest will need to come from electricity supply, from industry, from transport, right? So those are the, uh, the yards that are ahead of us. In recent years, we've seen about 7 million tons reductions per year in the electricity supply sector. Um, that's a lot, but that's not sufficient uh, by itself to achieve that target. So more is needed in industry, in transport, uh, in buildings and elsewhere. Uh, renewable energy deployment has been going strong in, uh, in Australia and is 
expected to keep going strong next year as well. These numbers, projections on the basis of um, mostly applications, permitting and so forth on clean energy regulator. Um, uh, thanks for that. Um, so around about five to six gigawatts of wind plus solar being installed and presumably uh, installed in, in future years as well. And we need it because coal plants are exiting and are exiting, will be exiting much more rapidly than had been announced today. So quite significant announcements just recently that bring that coal exit trajectory uh, forward and that raises all sorts of questions. Now, Investment needs in Australia's energy uh, sector, enormous, right? Like in the rest of the world, but coupled with tremendous opportunity uh, to actually expand renewable energy supply also for exporting um, industries. In the generation sector, obviously wind, solar, others, uh, but also energy storage, so a lot more needed there, pumped hydro batteries, other forms of storage, uh, expansion of transmission system, intergenerators, uh, interconnectors, and so forth, and also decentralized um, energy uh, integration, which we'll hear a lot more about in a second session uh, today. Uh, like I mentioned, tremendous opportunity also for Australia to be an exporter of renewables-based uh, commodities, um, as well as renewable energy in various carriers like uh, ammonia, hydrogen, uh, and others. Um, quite significant corporates develop corporate developments recently. Yeah, uh, uh, takeover bids currently under under consideration. Brookfield wants to buy Origin. Origin wants to be C wants to buy CWP. All of these deals are in the multi billion dollar uh, brackets and show you the the appetite um, to to buy uh, the opportunity to deploy large-scale renewable energy uh, generation, especially where that's coupled with a large customer base. Big changes, of course, also with AGL underway as well, and a lot moving in the offshore uh, wind area. Uh, policy, what are we looking at? Well, the main game right at this moment is the development of the safeguard mechanism, which will create an emissions price incentive in Australia's industry sector. Uh, then in electricity, all sorts of ha things happening mostly at the state level, both in terms of underwriting renewable energy investment, as well as uh, provisions for exiting coal plants, big questions around coordination there, especially between the major East Coast states. Um, federal government investments in transmission as well in storage, story too. Um, and we're seeing an increased role for public ownership there as well. And so uh, I guess emblematically the, uh, the suggestion uh, of a much stronger role for the revived Victorian State Electricity Commission there. Uh, and of course, you know, once we have a carbon price signal in the industry sector, the logical question is to ask, uh, well, what about a carbon price signal in the electricity sector? Um, things happening in transport as well, just to say, you know, uh, standards for electricity for uh, EV supply, uh, emission standards and transport sector, possibly at this point more effective than tax concessions or subsidies uh, and the need for world tax reform down the track. I'll end on the question of energy prices, right? And this is something that's a really, really big topic in countries that are not Australia in particular, but also here. So we've seen a very big uplift uh, in wholesale gas prices, as well as in electricity prices. This will gradually make its way to consumers and has already to an extent made its way to industrial customers, creating all sorts of problems. Um, and so the question is, what will anything be done about it? Should anything be done about it? And if so, uh, what? Um, I would just like to mention the argument in favor of supporting people with paying energy bills and businesses rather than suppressing gas prices because uh, the nature of fossil fuel systems is of course that the price is volatile and the nature of those systems right now is that the price is high um, and uh, I think there's a fair argument to be made not to uh, artificially subsidize uh, and thereby take away the incentives to substitute substitute out uh, of gas in particular. Uh, thank you very much and look forward to the discussion. Can I invite Anthea finally uh, to the front? Uh, so Anthea, as I mentioned, is the inaugural uh, Chief Executive of the Energy Security Board as of March this year. But before that, she held numerous senior roles in climate and energy policy at both um, the Victorian government and the Commonwealth level. So welcome, Anthea.
Uh, thank you very much. And um, it's wonderful to be here to be able to be part of this event. Um, so I've been asked to speak about um, give you the five minute version of this year's Health of the NEM report, which was published by the Energy Security Board. Now, I'm sure most of you do know, but the Energy Security Board uh, is the combined advice from our three energy market bodies. So the Australian Energy Market Commission, the Australian Energy Regulator and, and the Australian Energy Market Operator. So each year they provide um, a report on the health of the NEM. And so unsurprisingly, this year's uh, Health of the NEM identified um, some pretty big uh, risks and challenges that the market is facing. Um, and that really centred around three key, uh, three key themes. Um, again, unsurprisingly, the first of those themes was the really big challenge that we have at the moment around energy affordability. And we can see many more upward price pressures going on in the system uh, than downward pressures. Um, we, in, in relation to that, we can see that, um, you know, there, there's all sorts of strategies around to try and mitigate the impacts of some of that. So some of those will include, of course, energy efficiency, always a good idea, a very good idea when energy is tremendously expensive. Um, we can see the huge rollout of consumer energy resources, so things like solar PV and batteries and all of those sorts of things, uh, which are terrific and can have a real impact for the people hosting uh, those particular types of devices. Uh, and of course, the policy challenge is to make sure that those types of investments can benefit all consumers, not just the people who are able to have those in their own homes. One thing, a point that we made very clearly, we hope, in the report was that uh, an orderly transition is the most important thing that we can do in terms of trying to um, uh, manage this affordability question. Like the, if we have a disorderly transition, um, that would be a disaster from, uh, from an affordability perspective. We also highlighted the um, really highly unusual uh, role of extremely high fossil fuel prices that they're having on our energy system right now, driven by the Ukraine war. So it's a highly unusual circumstance that we find ourselves in on that front right now. The second kind of key theme that we identified in this uh, report was that how that our energy markets are really very, very closely interconnected. They've always been interconnected, but right now, uh, we're at this crucial time where we really need to pay attention to those interconnectedness and as we're thinking about um, both from an investment and from a policy um, perspective. So in particular, you would have you would have noticed, I think, um, the events of June this year. We had an extraordinary period in June, in, uh, which culminated in um, our electricity market being suspended um, for some time, an unprecedented event. Um, brought on by a number of factors, but one of those things was a confluence of issues in our gas markets coincidentally happening um, with our electricity markets. Um, so we really need to plan and think about those things together. This is only going to become more important as our journey of decarbonisation continues. Because if we think about that, we think, right, we need to decarbonise, we need to decarbonise um, our use of gas. Well, there's only really two main ways that we can go if we're thinking about that decarbonisation journey for gas. One is to electrify things. If we're stopping using gas and using more electricity, well, obviously we need that has an impact in terms of the investments and things that we need in the electricity sector. Uh, the second thing is, well, for the things that we're not going to electrify, or well, if we're going to use hydrogen as a substitute for gas for those particular types of uses, well, that will also have an impact back on the electricity system because we need electricity to produce the hydrogen, assuming that we're going to be making that uh, in a renewable way. So, uh, so we really need to think about those things together. Similarly, with liquid fuels, as we're thinking about uh, a journey to get uh, reduce and, and ultimately eliminate our use of liquid fuels in our economy, again, what are we doing? Well, we're either electrifying or we're using hydrogen and both those roads lead back to the electricity system. So when we're thinking about the scale of investments required and the timeframes and all of those sorts of things, we have to think about those things as in a coordinated bunch. The third key theme that we identified was the, 
the scale and pace and the urgency of the investments that we require uh, in transmission, in renewable energy and in flexible firming capacity. And we need all of those, huge amounts of all of those things and we need it really fast. All of this investment needs to occur against a backdrop of needing to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and all of the market bodies are extremely supportive of the fact that we will now be, jurisdictions are going to be including in our um, national energy laws an objective to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that will really be guiding uh, our overall energy market frameworks in a very formal way um, from here, which is great. Um, so achieving this huge physical build out is quite a feat that, we'll, that um, we need to concentrate on. But at the same time, as we've got this giant, you know, under construction sign over our entire physical electricity system, we've got a similarly large under construction sign over all of our frameworks and laws and rules, the institutional side of our energy markets as well, because we need to, um, make our regulatory systems and our, all of the rules, make sure that they are fit for purpose for a completely different type of energy system um, that, um, uh, that we need for the future. And as we identified in the report, both these tracks, both the physical and the rules and, and um, institution side, all of those reforms need to be pursued purposefully, urgently, and with the relentless focus on cost discipline. So, as I said, we need massive investments in everything, in uh, new renewable generation, transmission and firming resources. And if we do this, this will reduce our exposure to the shocks of international coal and gas prices. It will reduce our reliance on ageing thermal assets. And it will allow consumers to benefit from strongly connected, geographically diverse renewable energy sources. So, and we do need the frameworks to make these investments possible and to make them uh, likely. And we need to make sure that the frameworks ensure that they can be made at, at least cost. So this points to the importance of some of the reforms that are going on right now. So for example, the AEMC is currently doing, uh, is reviewing the RIT-T process and looking at really that process end to end of how uh, the approvals um, side of things happen in uh, for transmission investment. So the economic approvals and how much uh, money anybody's going to be able to charge for the transmission once it's built. Similarly, it imports to the process which is now being led by senior officials in relation to making sure that we can have enough firming resources in our system, um, which, is, which we need to complement the huge build up of uh, variable renewable energy that will form the, the basis of our system going forward. Uh, and given the affordability challenges that we're currently facing, we know we really need to get the most out of every single investment dollar that we're going to be putting in, particularly in things like transmission, which is enormously expensive, of course. And that's where the uh, Energy Security Board's work on transmission access reform comes in because it's vital to make sure that we get the most out of those huge investments that we need to make um, in, and including through the, um, the Commonwealth's Rewiring the Nation program. So we want to make sure that all of that um, transmission investment that we build, um, that we absolutely get the most out of that and we don't waste any of that investment, um, those investment dollars. So in, do build, in thinking about that huge physical build out, we also know that we need to find better ways, both within our market frameworks, but also more broadly, uh, to recognise the specific impacts that that huge physical build out might have for specific communities um, that are hosting those assets. And we need to do more to build social licence for that huge tra physical transformation that will need to occur. And finally, thinking about that enormous physical build that needs to take place, we highlighted the major co um, coordination challenges we face um, relating to things like land use planning, 
the availability of skilled workers and supply change requirements. And all of those things, of course, are suffering from the double whammy of still recovering from COVID uh, and now the war on Ukraine. So the physical challenge is enormous. The scale and pace of the regulatory and institutional change that's going on is also, is also enormous. But the one thing we know is that we can't stop Stopping is the worst, stopping part way through is absolutely the worst thing that we could possibly do. Uh, and that for best interest con of consumers, uh, we really need to make sure that we get on with the job of um, this transition, doing everything that we can to make sure that this is um, transmission uh, transition is as orderly as, as it can be. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anthea, for that stellar overview and for ending on a point close to my heart as a sociologist observing that this build out is a build in rural Australia and that our rural communities and First Nations people need to be brought in as proactive partners in this transition. Um, so our final uh, speaker is um, Tennant Reid, the Principal National Advisor in Public Policy for the Australian Industry Group. He's highly specialised, as you'll be unsurprised to learn, in climate and energy policy, having written multiple reports on things like natural gas supply, energy prices and energy efficiency. In another life, he was in the public service in Prime Minister and Cabinet um, and uh, you can find him on Twitter with extensive updates on the last UNFCCC negotiations. Um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Tennant. Thank you. It's really uh, good to have the chance to participate. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, I'm going to see if I can successfully share a couple of slides without belabouring them too much. Um, are those visible? Looks like they should be visible. Okay, um, so I'm largely going to talk about the safeguard mechanism, um, but I'll just make a couple of quick points first about energy prices uh, and about energy market transition. So on the prices front, like they're bad. They're going to be really bad unless something fundamental changes either in uh, the um, international markets that we're connected to or the nature of our connection to those international markets. The next couple of years are just going to be bloody horrible for energy users of all sorts. Uh, gas price uh, uh, parity with uh, international markets depicted uh, over the next couple of years on this chart. Uh, electricity wholesale price futures have been bouncing around, but at very high levels. This is the 2023 um, contract index. Uh, and the next few years really will see wholesale electricity prices at unprecedentedly high average levels. Uh, even if there is a, a turn for the good from an energy user point of view in wholesale prices at this point, quite a lot of futures have already been sold. Uh, some significant costs have already been incurred that will find their way to energy users. There are a lot of imaginable options for what can be done about this. Don't squint at this uh, slide too much, but the thing is that all the options are a bit bad one way or another, either uh, in the case of accelerating energy transition on both the supply and demand sides, that's great, that's well worth doing, it's a very big thing to do, and it's probably not going to be acceleratable in a way that will make a huge difference to anybody's outcomes in the next two years, say. There's a lot of other ideas, price controls, volume, export controls, financial assistance. All of these have got hairs on them uh, one way or another, the sorts of um, perverse impacts on, uh, on demand that Frank referred to uh, with price controls, also potentially need for... Um, for export caps to accompany price controls. But the worst thing of all will be to do nothing. And it looks as if the federal government has not left itself room to do nothing. Uh, so we'll see what the, the actual response winds up being. It's probably going to have to be a package of things with unsatisfactory but fast measures handing off to better but slow measures over time. Uh, we've had a, a not a lot of huge energy transition announcements in recent months. And just one point to, to highlight is that 
uh, when AEMO did their um, integrated system plan 2022 uh, update uh, back in May, uh, the, the upper dashed line on this chart represented the official retirement dates of coal generation capacity in the NEM. The, the stacked bars represented the central scenario for what AEMO modelled and um, stakeholders pur purported to believe was the most likely scenario. The lower dash line, the blue dash line, is our take on what the impact of the Queensland and Victorian coal closure announcements in October was. That is, it more or less brings official reality in line with the market operators and energy stakeholders' expectations of what was going to happen. Uh, so that that is that's that's probably going to bear some uh, some academic study in future of the somewhat alchemical process by which a consensus magic magicked itself into existence and then became policy. But it's a big deal, and while it's going to take a lot of delivering, the fact that we have uh, all jurisdictions uh, and the market operators and the energy stakeholders basically agreed on this very rapid transition is quite important. All right, safeguard mechanism. So this is the uh, the main policy lever by which the federal government uh, hopes to reduce industrial uh, and uh, resources sector and uh, very large transport network emissions in Australia. Uh, and there's a lot of moving pieces in the design. We're going to get their more detailed design, we think, next week. Um, but I'm going to highlight two broad issues. Like there's a lot of people who've been arguing over how baselines for large emissions intensive facilities should be drawn up. Um, there's a lot of uh, detailed fights in there that probably matter most just to the facilities themselves. The two biggest issues are, does the thing have to add up to an overall absolute emissions outcome? And that, 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 view that yes it does is the premise of the government's paper uh we expect it, that it will be reflected in the design uh, next week we haven't seen a lot of people contesting the idea that it should add up if that's the case all of these questions of baseline uh, setting, uh, industry average versus facility specific absolute versus intensity treatment of new facilities versus old facilities they all become zero-sum fights between different groups of facilities within an overall uh, pie that uh, definitely needs to shrink and keep shrinking over time. So uh, I think the, a major thing to look for in the upcoming design is what does it have to add up to? Is it preserving the 28% share of national emissions that covered facilities have today uh, through to 2030, which was the, the government's broad indication in the, the paper a couple of months ago? Uh, or is it going to be something at variance with that? And is it going to be able to contribute to the, the national 43% 2030 target? And even more importantly, to the targets that will follow that. The other issue that I'm going to highlight is trade exposure or carbon leakage or ET, emissions intensive trade exposed, however you want to refer to it. Um, this is still a major issue in the design of uh, crunchy um, climate policy in Australia. Are we going to impose costs that competitors don't face and see industries go out the back door? Now, this, this has been a long running fear um, the world has moved on in lots of ways since uh, the design of the uh, carbon pollution reduction scheme 15 years ago, uh, but this, the, the concern actually still remains relevant. Major economies are designing their carbon policies in ways that seek to avoid a loss of trade competitiveness. Um, the European Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism is about finding a better way to for Europe to do that same um, in insurance, uh, assurance of, of continued competitiveness, we're going to have to do it in some way too. Now, uh, the, um, the reason why this matters the most is really this is the major constraint on ambition. If you can address trade competitiveness in a sustainable way, Frankly, uh, a, a, a rapid march to uh, zero baseline, zero entitled emissions, 
um, would be a, a much simpler issue to uh, assess and to agree to. The government proposed a number of options, including uh, the uh, provision of financial assistance outside the scheme through the uh, uh, the Powering the Regions Fund and the um, National Reconstruction Fund. They proposed uh, maybe having slower baseline dec decline rates for uh, the facilities at risk of leakage. Both of those are a bit inadequate. Um, the, the slower decline rate for some entails a faster decline rate for others. Sooner or later, that becomes unsustainable. There is a clash between ambition and competitiveness and equity. Uh, but it could work okay for a few years because given the existence of these baselines that reduce over time, um, very few facilities would probably qualify as emissions intensive and trade exposed under the government's new approach to defining that. Um, the provision of financial assistance outside is uh, like it's fine. It, there's no necessary match between what assistance can assist at a point in time and what the impacts of the scheme may be. Uh, some stakeholders, very much including us, have proposed that Australia should consider a carbon border adjustment mechanism of its own to ramp up as the safeguard baselines ramp down. Uh, and we will see whether there is interest in that idea. This is something that would take several years to consider and implement. It's not something that could be ready for 1 July next year when the upgraded safeguard mechanism is meant to commence. But it is something that we think would be worth starting uh, right away to make it decidable and implementable in a three to five year time frame, which is more or less how long the uh, less satisfactory approaches to trade competitiveness might hang together with a bit of gaffer tape and uh, bailing wire. Um, so I will pause there and look forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Tennant. Um, we'll all join um, the stage now and uh, I'll ask, our, ask for questions. Ideally, um, at ISEDS, we call on a woman to ask the first question. If there's any burning questions out there um, uh, from the women in the room, that would be great. Um, and I'll just set up with the online um, Q&A as well. The, where's the roving mic? Hello. Um, do you have a question there? No. <laughs> okay, well, maybe I'll get us started off um, in my prerogative as chair. We heard some really um, uh, beefy uh, commentary on risks and challenges for government and the private sector. I'm wondering if while we um, sort out the list of questions from the floor, could you all just reflect on the key um, four roles that you think government need to play. Um, is it, as Frank almost hinted at, um, that we need to reconsider nationalisation? Um, and what forms of parallel regulation and public investment are you wanting to see prioritised? Could we get you started off, um, Frank? Is that all right before we... Oh, I was I was going to be polite and go last, actually. Uh, were you? Okay. That's, uh... Anthea, can we put you in the hot seat first? <laughs> sure. Um, well, uh, so look, we can see that governments have already jumping into this space. So I think um, you know we will we do expect to see considerable government led investment uh, in this space, particularly in relation to um, generation. Uh, and uh, in different areas in um, transmission as well. So as, as a direct owner um, of those kind of assets. We have seen a role in, um, from governments as well in terms of encouraging private sector investments, basically underwriting those investments. So that's another role that we can see governments have actively played. I think it'll be interesting to see how that evolves in the future. And I think a lot of that will depend on how our investment frameworks evolve and the extent to which governments feel that they need to um, take that investment role because they're worried that the, that the private sector response will be too little and too late. So, um, and some of that, 
you know, some of that work that we're doing to make sure that our frameworks are fit for purpose is about making sure that it's also an investable framework so that those investments aren't too little too late. Great. Thank you. Tenant, thoughts on the role of government? Um, perhaps you want to pick up on this carbon border adjustment mechanism idea a little more? Oh, don't, don't get me started. Uh, <laughs> I, I am a, a, a tragic on CBAMs. But on the role of government, um, I think we have seen maybe um, some uh, greater... Uh, talk about this then then backing it with um with resources from from some jurisdictions there was a lot of attention uh attracted by the the, the return of the state electricity commission of victoria but like that's a billion dollars of capital uh committed to that which like sounds like a lot of money to you and me but uh that's in a a, a nem transition that's going to take, according to the central scenario of the ISP, something in the order of $180 billion uh, over the next few decades. And for renewable superpower type visions, vastly more investment than that. So yes, governments are going to participate in this. They're going to um, de-risk investments. I do not see a lot of them lining up to finance the whole Megillah. Uh, and uh, I, but I do think they have an important role. And looking beyond electricity a little bit, an area where I think governments are going to have to make some some clear calls, not just wait and see what happens, um, is the gas transition, because uh, there's some significant network effects involved. Like li there's literal networks. Uh, and um, we could easily have quite a chaotic uh, transition that is either uncomfortably slow or uncomfortably fast in a in a quite uh, painful and chaotic way, um, because a death spiral is absolutely possible in gas networks. It's it's been uh, you know it's a very dated fear, uh, very very mid noughties fear for the electricity networks because distributed energy is great, but it's not so great that many people would really want to disconnect from the, the wider electricity network. But for gas, they could, they totally could. So, is it going to be a renewable gases pathway for different gas users, or is it going to be an electrification pathway? Either of them has a lot of hairs on it to make it work really well, and either is going to need um, like a clear steer from governments on what they want to happen. Are they putting the regulatory pieces in place? Are they, are they nationalising some assets? Uh, like we've had a lot of discussion of nationalising winners. Well, we might need to think about nationalising some losers. Um, so I, I think that definitely needs an active government role. And, and and on CBAM, well, if if people would like to read a a, uh, a sketch of what an Australian CBAM could look like, aigroup.com.au, our, our submissions page hosts a cracker. Okay, with that, Dorothy Dix are out of the way. Frank, would you like <laughs> yeah, to pick up on this? <laughs> very briefly, um, we've seen government play important roles in bringing new things into the world, right, including. Uh, you know, for example, through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, through ARENA, uh, through feed-in tariffs for early renewable projects, still underwriting these kinds of investments. Um, and also at the opposite end, and so just continuing from tenant there, really palliative care for the industries that are um, uh, on, on that downward spiral. There's, there's clear opportunities for governments uh, to help ease that uh, that journey um, and so uh, we're seeing governments uh, engaged in 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 that space in particular state governments and perhaps we will uh, see more of that uh, big pictures for the for, for the big dollars you know the classic role for governments uh, provide confidence for private actors to actually provide massive amounts of private money for these investments so policy regulatory frameworks market reform the classic roles for government Great, thanks. Now we have a question up the back. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wondered, it wasn't too many years ago that people were talking about overinvestment in poles and wires and, um, you know, the gold plating 
of um, poles and wires. And yet now we're talking about a massive increase in investment needed in um, trans the transmission network. So I'm assuming it's because a lot of where the uh, renewable energy facilities are gonna be are not where the old poles and wires were. But um, if that's the case, um, well, what are the challenges with um, ex vastly expanding the transmission network, including, you know, like um, in terms of community acceptability, are the where the transmission lines um, have to go, are they in kind of zones where there won't be environmental or other impacts? Anthea, do you want to pick that up, a, a kind of renewable energy zone meets ISP process? Sure. Or, um, we do see, so our um, national... Uh, transmission plan through the integrated system plan identifies the need for a huge amount of extra um, transmission capacity and this is concentrated think of this as in two batches really so one some major new interconnectors between states uh, and then secondly in within states um, the build out of these renewable energy zones they're both really important so the in particular if we have a look think about the role that interconnection between states um, plays. So if we're you know, looking forward to a future that's heavily, heavily dominated by variable renewable energy, if you're in a system that's dominated by those types of resources, being able to share resources becomes um, really important um, because that natural variability, its effect is diluted, uh, at least in fact, to a surprising amount, if you've got the benefit of ge um, geographic diversity. So, um, and as you pointed out, we don't have the poles and wires um, going to the right places at the moment in terms of um, where renewable um, resources, uh, where many of our renewable resources are going to be sited. So we do need massive investments, but we, but that said, we, we can't go, oh, well, it doesn't matter, we'll just invest it all and have no... Um, thinking about costs and Frank and I were just discussing before when everything's costing many 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 billions of dollars if you get it a little bit wrong that's a lot of money wasted that's just you know just comes out in the wash as just a kind of um, a loss for national productivity so uh, you really need to think about um, you can't let up your focus on making sure that those investments are well spent. Wonderful. I, I would agree I with that but but just yeah. to add one point which is We've had a lot of people um, who don't like one or another big project or, or kind of project in the last couple of years saying, oh, do we really need that? Um, I think we're going to be fine with whatever thing they like, whether it's uh, distributed energy or a different kind of energy storage or whatever else. And I think we need to be realistic that the scale of transition we're talking about, we're going to need a boatload of everything um and there, there's like there's no pathway that does not involve building things that are going to annoy a lot of people uh thank you for that realistic take on the build tenant now there's another question out up the back hello um i'm from new south wales and uh there's an election in four months time last saturday we had the victorian election um, I'm, I'm wondering what you would advocate the most, um, particularly in greenhouse gas emissions uh, reduction, as well as energy security. If you were a candidate in the, in the coming New South Wales election, what would you really be pushing for? We, it's a very foreign well, I, thought. I can, I can try to push these panellists who are not um, representing political parties uh, to try to channel their inner politician. Any thoughts from any of you about what you'd like to see from the state governments and particularly the party political dimension of that? I think I said, uh, I think there's something I already said in a video uh, on Twitter, so not make things worse now, uh, which is that if you'd asked this question or, or this comparison like two years ago, New South Wales would have been fairly clearly out in front of um, all the other states in terms of both the ambition and the, the, the detail of its plans, uh, particularly around electricity sector transition. And, and since that time, the other states have, have caught up or, or in some ways more so. 
Um, Victoria post its election will be pursuing a 75 to 80 percent emissions reduction target for 2035, which is a big deal and very, very much not business as usual um, outside the electricity sector. So um, there is certainly more for whoever wins uh, the coming New South Wales election to do on uh, both post-2030 ambition and on uh, extending the, the, the uh, really crunchy, uh, fully thought through policy beyond the electricity sector. I would just say it's actually an amazingly uh, a political issue in many ways, right? Because the issues are right there, uh, and it's not a question of of political left, right, uh, whatever color as to, as to what needs to be done, right? I mean, there's there's a number of coal fired power stations that will be exiting swiftly in New South Wales. You know, there needs to be uh, added uh, wind and solar supply, quick smart to replace that. There needs to be additional storage. All of this needs to be done in a cost effective way, right? Uh, there's a lot more, and and so not 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 to say that these things aren't being addressed in New South Wales, right? That's just the sort of things that need to uh, keep keep happening. And you know, on on the bright side, there's there's also enormous opportunity to build new industrial advantage, right? Including in New South Wales, in the other states as well, and territories in Australia, um, in terms of you know. Um, identifying the kinds of industries that will benefit long term, that will provide employment growth and value added growth in that low carbon transition. And those are things like, um, you know, zero emissions energy systems, decentralized energy, uh, smart charging systems, integrating uh, individual transport uh, with the smart grid of the future, et cetera, et cetera. So, we're on three, and with um, your implicit permission, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions, one from our panel, uh, so one from the uh, online Q&A and one from the audience. So there's a couple of questions uh, from our online audience about carbon pricing. One's, is it dead? And one is, are we looking at carbon pricing um, in the electricity sector as a likelihood? Um, I might get you answering that, and then we'll we'll take the final question here on the floor. <laughs> I, I, I could I could give a go. Um, I think it's alive uh, in the safeguard mechanism, isn't it, Tenny? Yeah. Well, look, uh, I think the the Greyjoys in uh, Game of Thrones say uh, that which is dead may never die, but rises again, harder and stronger. Um, the, uh, like, I think we should all be, um, comfortable in saying, uh, that the, a, a safeguard mechanism with lowering baselines, crediting of overperformance, access to, um, credits, uh, within or without Australia to some degree, uh, like that is a form of, uh, carbon pricing scheme. It's not one that governments make any money out of necessarily, but it is one that puts uh, a uh, a carbon price into a piece of the economy, and that's fine. The 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 details uh, of design matter. People can argue about that, but it's just a very sane kind of of scheme and extremely internationally unexceptionable. Uh, so, like, let's just get on with it. Um, electricity sector, it would be helpful, actually, to have a clear um, systematic solution to sectoral emissions. Uh, I think we saw with the earlier phase of the, or the, the recent phase of the debate about the um, capacity mechanism in the uh, national electricity market, that the absence of that clear solution to emissions made it really hard to talk about anything else. Um, and if that was there, then you know, you wouldn't need to have weird, complex uh, shoehorn stuff in like states opting out of um, a mechanism because they're worried about um, emissions results. So, yeah, it would be better for everybody. Let's do it. But I think that <laughs> one's probably at the back of the federal government's queue of big reforms they're trying to do, including the safeguard mechanism. Uh, no, I don't think I'll need to add anything to that. Thanks, uh, Tenant. <laughs> Look on first principle, of course, you want a carbon price 
where you can uh, actually feasibly implement a carbon price. And once we have a carb an emissions price signal in the industry sector, it's only logical to have it in the electricity sector as well. What speaks against it is that, you know, there's, there's the view that, well, you know, things are already moving in electricity, so you don't need a carbon price to make things move, right? But you'll make things move more smoothly and more rapidly in the electricity sector with the carbon price. Um, and there's your argument for it. The other argument against it is, of course, you know, the political one. And are we really sure that uh, that the carbon price wars federally uh, are, are dead, buried, and cremated, or shall they come back? Um, so uh, that's that's, I guess, what really stands in the way. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, our question up here. Thank you. Hi, thank you. At risk of keeping everyone, I'll keep this brief. Um, I wanted to pick up on a point the tenant made about uh, trade exposure and trade competitiveness. So um, my question is around, you know, if we if we impose high prices here, then it um, undermines the competitiveness of domestic industry and they could leave through the back door. If we don't impose a price, it could increase their vulnerability to, you know, CBAM-like measures or um, increase the likelihood of emissions intensive industry moving to Australia. Um, how do we balance this um, fine line between competitiveness of industry versus our emissions reductions ambitions? Great question. Tenyon, do you want to start us off? And I might give the other two panellists a final word along those lines. Sure. Well, I, I think I think, uh, I think the other panellists have got a wealth of experience in this area too. But I, the, the things that we need to do are, one, just like it is a real issue. It's not the only issue in uh, this design and achieving transition is tremendously important, but this is something we need to deal with along the way, both for the, uh, the, the risk of that falling behind and losing competitiveness by failing to transition, as well as the risk of um, excessive costs at a point in time creating a competitive disadvantage. Um, what we really need to try to achieve is actually not um, excision of or, or, or leaving sectors out uh, of policy, but a level playing field between uh, producers inside and outside Australia. And um, as big a, um, a change as it is from a lot of attitudes and, and specifics of Australian, um, at least the vibe of Australian trade policy, um, a carbon border adjustment mechanism could deliver exactly that, a level playing field, while being completely consistent with the spirit and the letter of our WTO commitments. Um, so uh, that, that's where I would look. Um, you could do stuff that you call a CBAM that's actually not functional, but there's, a, there's it's perfectly possible to design one that would work very well to reconcile these issues, preserve a strong signal for decarbonisation within Australia, um, but avoid that um, that fear of leakage. Great, thanks. Would you like the last word? Oh, no, I would love to. I don't mind. <laughs> I um, I, look, I think Janet's right in his comment there that the important thing, that trying to juggle both those things and take, um, trying to take uh, the, the impact away while, while we have these kind of uneven global issues going on, but preserving in its sharpest form the incentive to reduce emissions locally, trying to do both those things at once has been kind of the aim of the game for many years now of a, a range of um, a range of mechanisms. So so I certainly agree um, with tenant that that's uh, that that's not what that's what needs to occur and it's it's really refreshing to know that that's just complete excision. Um, from any kind of mechanism is not what's being asked for by industry. I think that's a very promising sign. So. Yeah, so ET assistance are traditionally seen as preventing carbon leakage, shielding emissions intensive trade ex exposed industries from unfair international competition. But these are transitional things, right? If we're heading to net zero, as we're fairly confident we will be, right? Um, then what you're looking at in the long term is not emissions intensive traded industries, but energy intensive traded industries that will run on zero carbon energy, right? And then the problem disappears. Um, and so really, you know, want to think about this as transitional arrangements for industries that are in themselves in a transition to clean energy sources. And so that needs to be arranged in a 
in, in, in some sort of appropriate manner, but in one that fully preserves the incentives to actually decarbonize. Great. Well, thank you um, all three for an excellent start to our energy update. We've had an um, incredible survey of multiple sectors across our electricity market and the um, industrial sector and uh, intersecting issues of international trade and geopolitics. We're looking at big industrial change here. Um, and th I thank you for the insights you've given us. Uh, and I note the, the range of policy expertise as well as attendance to the equity issues that are playing out on the ground. Um, and I look forward to the rest of the day with you all. Before we go on to the next session, we're having an afternoon tea, is that right? Yeah, and back around 3.30. Back around 3.30. Sorry for eating into that um, mingling time, but I hope you agree it was worth um, hearing those last points. So uh, talk to you soon.